Hey, a random stranger. How you going? Uh, today we're on for two more episodes of Fate Zero, which I cannot wait for. And judging by the comments from the last time, we've got a decent bunch of people who are already deep into the fate lore and the psychology of this Holy Grail war, which is great. I predict that we're going to have a bunch of fun just discussing the finer points of relics and summonings and master-servant dynamics and all that jazz. Also, I can only imagine how hard it must be to not spoil things for this kind of show, so thank you so much for being so good about that. Uh, I also want to thank this show for validating my life <laughs> and what I spend a lot of my time thinking about and reading about things like history and myths and legends uh, because well someone in the comments found it funny that I'd picked out in the ED that scene of Arthur or Arturia killing Mordred who was it yeah Joey <laughs> I I to explain that you know by pure chance last year I took a course um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the great courses but it's these bunch of courses you can do on Audible on all sorts of weird topics. And I completed last year the 24-part course on the Arthurian legend. And it had, you know, this decent section on the Battle of Camelon, which, of course, according to some versions of the story, where Arthur fought his nephew slash son Mordred and killed him, but also suffered a mortal wound himself. So yeah, the point is I'm incredibly excited that being so nerdy pays off sometimes and I'm glad that we can nerd out together. So I was trying to pin down exactly why I'm so excited about Fate Zero this early on and I think there are three main things. The first is the historical nature of the subject matter and how it binds these characters, particularly the servants, to the overall plot and shapes their internal conflicts as well as the conflict that they develop with other characters. For example, King Arthur or Arturia, the King of Knights, whose voice I love, um, she's based on an actual legend who in turn was based on a real life person in history around whom an incredible storm of theories and speculation has built up over the centuries. So from this one character, you can kind of go wild with what motivates their participation in the Grail War and what will draw them to or repulse them from her master and vice versa. In terms of Arturia's personal struggles, she seems to carry this immense shame or regret about losing Britain uh, to it would have been the invading Saxons back in the 6th century when, you know, Britain was still Romano-Britain and not actually England yet. Also, she seems to have this very palpable sense of inadequacy, uh, or at least perhaps being every bit as powerful and as intimidating as a ruler can be, but having to deal with societies like eye-roll-inducing backwardsness with regards to her gender. Upon being summoned by Kiritsugu, Arturia is clearly unconvinced of the deal that she got given, maybe even feels a bit shortchanged. Not only is she wary of his surprise at her gender, which turns out, you know, to not be the issue, but she's also suspicious of his character and his intentions for the Grail. And she kind of has reason to be, given his method of getting shit done boils down to whatever it takes. And uh, Naitenor made a good point about the scene where Kiritsugu and Ilya are looking for chestnut buds, which was an incredibly cute scene and definitely showed a softer side to Kiritsugu, maybe even helped soften Arturi's view of him. But in that scene, Naitenor noted that uh, Ilya calls Kiritsugu a cheater and he responds with, Daddy can't win otherwise. It's a pretty telling statement given that to achieve his goals, he has done some underhanded things. Yeah, so pitting that against what we know about Arthur the legend, Kiritsu not batting an eyelid at cheating or killing innocents or killing his own kind, like mages, puts him on this collision course with Arturia, who adheres to something like the Arthurian code of chivalry, uh, which, again, based on the legend, uh, developed out of the 
infamous, you know, Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of Britain Kings volume. Basically, the code involved, like, living and fighting with honour, protecting the weak and innocent, refraining from any sort of deceit, not fighting in the shadows, <laughs> everything that Kiritsugu is not. I mean, Kiritsugu himself says that he would have been more suited to a caster or an assassin servant. Irisville, though, is pretty convinced that Arturia will come around to see Kiritsugu's view of things, and I found that very intriguing because I am getting, like, super good and wholesome vibes from Irisville, so if she is able to love someone like Kiritsugu and even share his vision for what he wants with the Grail, I think that says a lot about his core character, despite all the dodgy stuff. Um, Also something super random about Iris or Irisville. I experienced my first, wait, isn't this the voice of another character moment when Ari was talking and I was right because it turns out that she's actually Alicia from Aria, which also means she was Ozen from Maiden Abyss. And I think it was because of her super like ara ara vibes that, that, we're able to cut through to someone like even me who is super bad at recognizing voices. So there's definitely more to Kiritsugu than meets the eye. Uh, he's clearly guilty over how he'll somehow cause Arisville's death to the point where he felt he didn't deserve to hold his kid. There's also that interesting twist with the Grail, you know, summoning masters who need it the most. Generally, like obviously there are exceptions. For Kiritsugu, he seems to have this deep need to save the world, to make it into a place where people aren't forced by fate or other circumstances to do things that they don't want to do, especially little kids. It's why Irisville says that he dislikes how Arturia was forced by her advisors to become king, even though Arturia herself had clearly thought through the choice and yet still made the decision to pull the sword from the stone. And interestingly, it's Arturia's resignation to that fate, which also pisses off Kiritsugu. So his intense dislike of fate and what it forces on people is maybe also why he shows up in war zones where the fighting is heaviest, possibly to sway the war one way or another and thus putting an end to them. Because war, as we all know too well, is the ultimate driver of chaos that forces people to do things that they otherwise wouldn't do. I also think that this his total disregard for his own life may have something to do with how if you're someone who can't stand the sight of senseless war and people being exploited by others and suffering these terrible fates, the world is going to wear you down because that is just reality. To the point where maybe Kiritsugu doesn't even want to exist himself anymore, so he doesn't have to see all of this suffering. He's almost a shell of a human, with the only thing keeping him going, uh, his dark sense of justice that's within him. Like, that's the only reason why he's still alive. So that is quite the complex character sheet. In one sense, Kiritsugu wants good for everyone, But I feel he also, like Arturia says, tends to make decisions for everyone else according to his vision of the good, which can be problematic and highly controversial because that itself is forcing a certain choice or a fate onto others, which is ironically the very thing that he hates. The admirable thing about Kiritsugu is that he's not about gaining power just for the sake of becoming powerful. Uh, It's always directed towards the use of some higher goal. Even when, for example, he was able to summon a servant wielding Excalibur in the Saber class, which means he has one of the most powerful servants, his concern is how to use that power towards this loftier goal of world salvation. Uh, You know, marrying into the Ironsburn family was likely just another tool. The fact that Excalibur's sheath um, halts the aging process, the fact that he was given that, by the Ironsburn elder. I mean, Mato would totally... Who is it? What's his name? Zoken. Zoken Mato would totally want to get his grubby old hands on that. And yet it says a lot about Kiritsugu's character that 
the that the Einsburns were willing to give it to him, knowing that he wouldn't abuse that privilege and use it for his own selfish ambitions. In a sense, Kiritsugu seeing absolutely everything and everyone as a tool is efficient and utilitarian, but also it's another potential point of contention between him and Arturia, given how Sabre is literally a legendary king and being treated as just a tool is a huge no-no. I know I've talked a lot about the master-servant dynamic between Kiritsugu and Arturia quite a bit, because I am at this stage probably the most fascinated by them, but I do want to include a, a quick fire round on my thoughts of the other masters and servants that we have been introduced to. So first is Iskandar and Waver Velvet. I love Iskandar's humor and also Waver's desire to shake things up in this very traditions bound world of mages, that he is thinking beyond this incredibly bold, more like prejudiced view of pure bloods being the best thing ever, to the point of stealing a relic and summoning Ryder himself, then heading to the Far East to hypnotize a random old couple so that he has a roof over his head while he fights his war. My favorite moment with Iskander was how he laughed at how puny the land he conquered in his lifetime was, which is why now his goal is absolute world domination. And then the fact that he slapped Waver for being small minded, for only wanting to gain the respect of others. I guess that is their conflict, learning to respect each other and trying to come to some common goal. You know, I feel also that those two are going to be the comedic relief for much of Fate Zero. Uh, Also, random cool note, I love that they play vaguely classical Greek music in Phrygian mode whenever Iskanda is on screen. I feel it was a nice musical signal uh, of his Greek Macedonian identity as Alexander the Great. Kenneth L. Malloy Archibald master in the clock tower and also Waver's lecturer. Even his name is incredibly hoity-toity and it sounds like he was able to acquire another relic, so I guess he's still in the war. He stubbornly holds to this idea that blood determines a mage's ability and on that I wondered also if blood can determine a mage's magical affinity, you know, as in whether they have a bias for fire or water or wind, elemental magic. Uh, so, like, the Torsakas seem to have this red theme going on, maybe to symbolize that their family is a fire magic mage family. I don't know. Uh, Bluebeard, whoever he is, and Ryonosuke, I mean, that is just one family-friendly partnership. One is descended from a family of demon researchers and loves murdering little kids. But, you know, Ryonosuke, he is also quite primitive at that right now, which means he has a lot to learn from Bluebeard about the finer art of playing with his prey and learning how to draw out suspense and spin their emotions and their hope before brutally crushing it. Uh, I found it interesting how also Bluebeard described the grail as the vessel of paradise. Uh, I, I don't know, I can't imagine Arturia describing it like that. It kind of makes you think, like, what would Bluebeard's version of Paradise be? And it's probably an endless supply of innocent children to torture. And I don't even want to think about it. Archer and Tokiyomi. I mean, I'm still working on the identity of Archer, whose relic was a fossil of the very first skin shed by a snake. It is mildly annoying because based on the image of him with the lion and the Persian or like the Mesopotamian type drawings in the background, I feel like I really should know who he is. Uh, By the way, yeah, thanks to those of you who answered my question around whether I should look up the identities of the servants. Uh, I think for now I'm going to wing it and just see how I go, if I can pick up on more details or if they actually just reveal it explicitly in the coming episodes. It's still early days and it's kind of fun to draw conclusions from these little clues. Uh, But yeah, back to Takiyomi, he's definitely a character I feel I would not vibe with well in real life. 
seeing how Tokiomi's wife, Aoi, talked about accepting that part of marrying into a great mage family means sacrifices will have to be made. Uh, I mean, she was clearly not the instigator of the child swap. So we have to assume Tokiomi was, or at the very least, he allowed it to happen. And it's not even that Sakura was fostered out to the Matos. She is literally no longer their child. The question is... Why was Tokiomi willing to do that for the Matos? Like, does he owe them something? Or maybe he's just a pure believer in keeping the legacy of the old mage families alive, even if it means helping out an old enemy. Something about fighting honorably, I don't know. Like, certainly his high sense of pride about what it means to be a mage suggests that he is capable of being that lofty-minded and sacrificial to the point of using his own family as pawns in this bigger game. Berserker and Karia Mato. I mean, Karia is a lower-level mage and, and to make up for his lack, interestingly added two lines to his incantation so that he'd get a servant with a berserker affinity, which I found very interesting. Like, Also, Karia just in general has a sad face. <laughs> Who can blame him though? Because he suffers from the most dysfunctional father-son relationship I have ever beheld, which is probably why he abandoned the family in the first place and like all power to him. However, you know, fate once again just drawing him back to the war because inadvertently his leaving led to Sakura suffering in his place. So he's taking steps to remedy that in hopes that if he gets the grail, then Sakura can be set free. She still has to suffer for a year though, which is awful. Um, yeah, basically also because Zoken is using her as a backup in case Karia fails to get the grail. Uh, I love the relationship between Karia and Sakura. Like they are two people who have been horribly abused and or abandoned by their fathers. And she is just a child, so she doesn't really have a proper grasp on what's been done to her and, and how inhumane it is. She's all acceptance because what else can a kid do? Also, you know, this Grail War is high stakes for Karia in the sense that he promised Sakura that he would be, or she would be reunited with her family. And I get the sense that he feels like he doesn't want another kid to have to go through what he did as a child. And that even if his life is going to be totally ruined, it'd be worth it if it saves Sakura. And I think that is an incredibly worthy, if also very tragic reason for his participating in the war. And then of course there's Assassin or Hassan, the spy heroic spirit, and Kide. Uh, another, I guess Hassan is another mythical figure that I'm not familiar with. And we can talk about Kide in the context of the second thing that I'm really enjoying about Fate, which is uh, pretty much actually what, where was it? What Hoffertel mentioned in their comment that uh, the relationship between each master and servant is really great, but you can also pair almost any two characters together and get really interesting dynamics, such as Kide versus Kiritsugu and uh, Kide Kotomine versus Karia. Makes for a very fun character web chart, which on this channel, of course, that we love. Uh, but yeah, it's the intrigue of the potential complexity of a fairly large cast of characters. So seven sets of masters and servants, and trying to pass or predict how they will clash against each other or enable each other or any of the multitude of ways that people and legendary spirits can relate to each other. Also, it would be super fascinating to see if they actually form any alliances amongst them and which pairs would work in that way. Also, the very concept of master and servant, you know, it appears to be more a contractual equal partnership than the literal or the traditional interpretation of what a master and servant relationship looks like. I got absolute chills when episode one ended with Saber turning around and then saying the words, are you my master? But the word master was said like it was Kiritsugu who owed all deference to her. And why not? Because she is the king after all. Uh, same thing with Ryder. When Waver tried to exert his dominance, he fails horribly because... 
at the end of the day, these are legendary spirits who were once upon a time kings themselves. And it just so happens that the Grail bound these two together in this like limited contractual sense. So yeah, they the masters also have like three command seals, but it is just three. So there is a limit to that too. Speaking of which, um, Saber, it reminds me that I would like to show off <laughs> my Saber. Uh, hopefully you guys can see that. Let me just put it here. Yeah, so this is the reason why I started watching like Fate Zero. And I don't know if you got like, I really like the detail in this figurine. I don't even remember how much it cost me now. Uh, but yeah, it's a it's a fairly legit replica of a bike. Like you can see the all the hydraulic pipes and then part of the exposed engine. Um, the front fairings are pretty badass and the mufflers too. But like my favorite part, oh, I don't want to like, it's so fragile. But yeah, my favorite part is actually, um, I don't know if you can see this either, but there are like these scuff marks on the ground. Um, it's like, obviously because Sabre is too powerful for normal gravel roads. Uh, yeah, so actually I can't wait to see her in this outfit in the anime, but yeah, that is why that figurine is the reason why we're even watching this show. <laughs> okay, so the rivalry that I'm keeping my eye on most right now is the one which was given the most attention in the opening episodes, uh, and that's this deadly cat and mouse game that's developing between Kiritsuku and Kirei. The way they're setting up those two and the parallels between them lends a lot to the prediction that they'll possibly be the last two standing in this war. Uh, some of you also mentioned their particular rivalry as well, so i just pull those comments up. Um, Rentrist and Dela Cruz. I like those alternating s scenes in episode one where Kiritsuku Emiya, former mage killer, and Kirei Kotamine, priest, are talking about each other. What caught my attention are the different printers in those scenes. In the Kirei scene, there is a mechanical or magical fax machine, while in the Kiritsugu scene, there is a regular printer connected to a laptop. It has old versus new or magic purist versus tech user vibe. Kirei, while reading the report about Kiritsugu, did mention that Kiritsugu used a bomb and sniping to kill mages, and Tokiomi mentioned that Kiritsugu uses tactics unsuited to a mage. This reminds me of a meme where Harry Potter used a gun against Voldemort. Muggle. Avocadabra, it kills people. Yeah, we have that too. And then they open the drawer full of guns. Perfect, perfect use of the gun-toting Harry Potter meme. Uh, and very good points about Kiritsugu almost, uh, almost deliberately dispatching of mages in the most insulting manner possible to them. Uh, I do find it interesting that Kiritsugu was a mage who killed mages on behalf of the Mages Association, while uh, Kirei seemed to have played the equivalent role in the church, you know, as an executor of heretics. Both of them were used by their organizations to weed out undesirables, and both shared this brutality or a willingness to act in the shadows. However, both of them also seem to not be so committed to their respective organizations. Kiritsugi himself was a freelancer and Kirei just seems like he's working for the church only because he was born into it and his dad has a high position in it. Um, and also because it seems like he has nothing else better to do as opposed to really believing in what the church stands for or is working towards in this Holy Grail war. Also from Ragishingo, pay attention to why Kirei Kotomine frightens Kiritsugu so much. Kirei has rightly understood that Kiritsugu is not just some mercenary in it for the money. Kiritsugu also made a determination about Kirei, that the man has no true passion. This is definitely a show of viewpoints, of plans and strategies, along with some flashy combat. Yeah, uh, so about Kirei having no passion. I mean, what's interesting is that Kirei had no prior connection to magic. You know, he's not a mage, at least before the three years that he went into training under Tokiomi. And yet he was chosen by the Grail. He found the whole thing weird. And so does Kiritsugu, apparently, who assumed that the Grail would only choose people with a strong desire for something like himself. 
not someone like Kirei who believes in nothing. Um, and I also wonder like if Kirei was always going to betray Tokiyomi or whether in the three years that he was training under him to become a competent mage that he just got bored because of his lack of passion and of ambition. Like he can't even focus on a single area of magic to specialize in. Maybe it was also resentment from being thrown into a war that he didn't want to be part of in the first place. So yeah, Kirei is a bit of a chaotic neutral character. Meanwhile, Kirei is perplexed or also terrified that Kiritsugu would risk his life or appear to want to die for a reason that escapes him. You know, he says that it's crazy that someone would have no concept of self-interest, no calculation of risk and reward. And for someone who has no passion for anything like Kirei, Kiritsugu, who is all passion, is terrifying. Both of them are asking the same question of each other, which is, then what is he after? And I think I think Kiritsugu's goal, at least, is quite clear, to save the world from the general ugliness of war, even if it means shedding blood. But Kirei, I'm going to say, my guess is that maybe he is actually a hidden little psychopath who can't handle the tedium of life. And if he doesn't have something to occupy himself with, he's left with his own demons. And perhaps he wants to find some end to this unending state of not caring about anything so much. If true, that in many ways to me is a lot scarier than Kiritsugu. Like, Kirei might turn out to not have a conscience at all, at all, whereas it's abundantly clear that Kiritsugu does, perhaps even too much of one, that it drives him to very extreme methods to do the right thing. Um, there were other really interesting parallels between those two, with Kirei having lost his wife, and then Kiritsugu, who appears certain that his involvement in the Holy Grail War will cost him his. And I do wonder if the way that Kirei's wife died had something to do with the work he does for the church, and hence that would explain a lot why he just has lost all of his passion. Um, you can also compare the way that they treat kids too. Like, Kiritsugu has a genuine soft side with Ilya. Um, you know, so much so that it impressed Saber and makes her rethink what she thinks he is. Compared to how Kirei was with, with, what was her name, with Rin, he retained this cold, calculating side, um, of his when dealing with her and his offers to help her carry her luggage is, was kind of laced with a lack of genuineness and, and maybe even a bit of irony. So Rin knows what's up that Kirei is not trustworthy, which I don't get why her parents, Tokiyomi and Aoi, both seem to put a whole lot of trust in Kirei, and they are definitely going to pay for it in some way, shape, or form. Some lore-related speculations I just want to throw out there. I'm interested to see whether this idea that the older mage family is, the more powerful, also applies to servants. So as in the longer they go back in history, the more powerful they are. Though, when I thought about this, I kind of struck that idea off just based on how both the Einsburns and the Martors seem to be pretty beaten down, despite being two of the three original mage families, who seem to like take after the European royal families in terms of their preference for incestuous marriages. The Einsburns, like, having to marry one of their own to someone like Kiritsugu, a mage killer, and someone who's outside of their family. I mean, the shock of that, you know. And the Matos were forced to steal a daughter from the Torsakas and treat her as like a baby carrier. So this idea that each generation of mages passes down their secret knowledge of magic and hence becomes stronger with each generation clearly doesn't hold true. Also, it's been 200 years since the first family summoned the Grails, which works out to be about like three wars to date, and this current one being the fourth one, I think. The selection of masters was also intriguing in that it makes it sound like the Grail has a mind of its own. So I assume it was also the instigator or the one who determined that this war was how they would settle who gets to use it to make a wish. Uh, it kind of makes me also wonder if the Grail is less a physical vessel, like how it's often portrayed, but more maybe a, even a person or a soul or a spirit of some kind. 
Uh, also, the role of the church. I mean, it's meant to be a neutral party, but obviously they too have a dog in the fight, which is why they're helping Takeyomi win this war by transferring Kirei over to the Majors Association. Um, and I guess they support Takeyomi because they have a shared goal of reaching the root, whatever that means. I almost forgot that I was actually going through a list of three things of why Fate is so awesome. So the last thing really is, I mean, the show just looks bloody good. Uh, my favorite scene visually was when Assassin was doing his Mission Impossible evasion of the protective magic barriers. So I'm super hyped for the fight scenes too, judging purely on the OP. And then finally, I mean, I was made aware of the scale of the Fate universe. So Malfeasance wrote in with a fun fact that Fate has alternate timelines, which I wasn't aware of, including one where Ar King Arthur is male, voiced by the same VA as Arturia's Merlin, but his Merlin is female, who is voiced by Arturia's VA. Uh, yeah, so very awesome to note, like, I kind of have a thing for alternate timelines. Steins Gate was my gateway drug to anime, basically, and I don't know after Fate Zero, how much I'm going to be able to get into the Fate universe, given the massive list of animes that I have to get through. Uh, we'll see, but I'm definitely enjoying a lot of the concepts and the workings of this universe already. Okay, guys, we are ready to start episode three, Fuyuki City. Uh, so let's jump back into this war. If you guys are ready, let's do this in three, two, one, play. Oh yes, Remimada, I am using the uh, Funimation version, so it's got all this pre-logo stuff. Just sipping on his red wine. <gasps> oh! Oh, king of all kings. Well, that makes sense, because he is the one with the oldest myth. Oh, Gilgamesh, okay. He wasn't he like half human, half uh, god? <laughs> He's just all about collecting treasures. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of confusing who the master is and who the servant is in this particular relationship. His voice is so slimy. <laughs> There's very selfish reason for wanting the grail. Doesn't even know if the grail's worth his time. So basically, it was all a setup. Like, oh, sorry, it kind of froze a bit there. But yeah, the attack on Tokiyomi was all planned beforehand, so it would look like they are actual enemies, right? Maybe it's to sort of draw out other servants. Because they do have to keep up an appearance of being enemies. It's all very scandalous, the fact that the church is helping one of the masters get the grail. Oh, that's sad, the way that Tokiyomi just is not present with his family. 
No, oh, those movements with the swords, just the way that... Yeah, that's incredible. I can't wait to see whatever that move is. Jazz, fantastic voice, whoever sings this. She's singing quite high, but it's so strong. Oh, I love Saber so much. Okay, so I saw um, Archibald with a servant that we've not yet seen. I mean, that was super quick. <laughs> Still got his gauntlets on. I was just learning about modern warfare. <laughs> oh, we got a butt scratcher. I don't know, did they somehow fake Assassin's Death so that the other masters would think there's one less in the game? <laughs> Subarashi! <laughs> oh my gosh, imagine if King Alexander the Great had access to B2s. That's friggin' scary. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh my... <laughs> well... It's so funny, people from the future are like... Mm. <laughs> Lancer. It's noble phantasm. I don't know what that is. So he was spying on this fight? Somehow he was there. <laughs> Head flick. <laughs> uh. Flashy gold guy. Yeah, see this can you hear this music? It's very like Greek sounding. Okay, so it's some kind of superpower. Oh. I guess that's why in the OP, Atria was like, waving her Excalibur and doing something amazing with that. Oh, are they his, like, treasures? Sort of his plunder from when he was a ruler? They're all different swords. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, poor dude. <laughs> uh, I really like him. It's all about the moment. Carpe diem.
Oh no, he's probably be like, where is the red light district? <laughs> he needs a bar, man. Like a proper stocked bar. Uh, okay, that I guess that is why Tokiomi and Kirei set that show up. So that the other masters would start acting and they can, I guess, pick them off. Oh. Eh? What? Oh, he is in on the plan too, obviously. Again, it's just a show. Man, even in this anime, the church is like a dodgy, two-faced organization. Yes, he's still alive. Yeah. Oh. Assassin is a woman? Or, I don't even know if they have genders, but... Oh. Oh. Isn't that cheating? I don't know. How can you have one servant that splits into. Hmm. I guess the shadow is, I don't know, ubiquitous. So you can just keep sending these shadows after them, like one after the other, and still he'd have more servants to send. Hmm. Oh, back in Japan. <gasps> Gay panic. <laughs> I like their contrast, like the white and the black. Oh, it's like a brain download. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Arisville gets it. Oh my god, did that actually happen? <laughs> Who's the hat following them? Thompson Maria Watson. Wait, what? Where's Kiritsugu? I feel like, wait, these two are just being such a married couple right now. What? <laughs> just even dressing her? Oh, so it was Irisville who chose to put her in that black suit. <laughs> oh. oh, so Arthur knows it's like typically a man's dress. 
Ah, oh, okay. She's so cute, just like open wide, like open eyed looking at the world. <laughs> just like, might as well do some sightseeing before the war starts. She's very straight and narrow. She's more playful. They balance each other out so well. Oh, I was thinking about something else, but <laughs> okay. Oh. Like, why is she blushing? What does she mean she was a puppet? She's not born naturally? Was she created to be used in this war somehow? This music is so sad. Oh, <laughs> she's so sweet. I shouldn't say this, but I feel like I really wish these two had been master and servant. <gasps> My glove came off. Oh, <laughs> so cute. I'm glad they have these moments of sweetness in what is a fairly dark show. What is he doing? Room 703. Oh. Well, he's going to be doing a lot of mage killing with that stash. <gasps> oh, no. Oh, that's kind of an asshole move, isn't it? He's putting her in danger. I'm sure it, he has it all figured out, but still. Atria would not stand for that. Hmm. Smart. Also, who is she? Like, his assistant? Maya. <laughs> yeah, he smells something dodge. Yeah. Probably knows the church is in on this war as well. Like, no ones for me. What is that? Huh. That's an interesting fire. Huh? What's that pattern on it? What? Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, yeah. Uh. 
No. <gasps> Iris Bill, you've been done dirty. I am so mad on her behalf. That's shit, man. <sighs> it's okay, she's got Saber. <laughs> Everyone gets their own, you know, side person. Maybe it's an open marriage, who knows. I guess their marriage was political. She's smiling, even Saber is smiling. <laughs> Yeah, because that is not what Kiritsugu is. He's definitely not a gentleman. Oh man, I feel like she's just making the most of her life because she knows she's going to die somehow soon. Hmm... Yep. That makes sense. It definitely puts an interesting spin on the legend if Arthur was a young girl. What an existence. Also, he probably feels guilty for her role in the war, right? Because obviously he has something to do with it. <gasps> oh, so other servants can detect, like, other servants in the vicinity? feel uh these two are so freaking badass man oh. <laughs> they can't fight in super populated areas right because they need to keep it all hidden He's like, we'll eventually conquer London too, <laughs> Japan first. All right, so they are in a deserted place. This is new. We've not heard this voice before. Is this Lancer? Just based on his weapon. Yeah. Oh, wait, so is, does this mean it's Lancelot? He seems to be a knight too. Because he seems to be speaking with this like sense of honor and stuff, honor code and all that. combat outfit oh this epic like orchestra music is perfect for arterio with the trumpets <gasps> oh first fight first blood oh <gasps> I love them. Oh no, don't. Oh, I guess we can watch the next episode. Yeah. <laughs> also, I love the countdown that they do with every episode. Ah, <laughs> so high. Can we just skip the song? No, we won't. Maybe we'll find some other clues. All right, but fantastic that we've seen Lancer now, who I feel feeds into my theory that 
he possibly is Lancelot or at least one of the knights of the round table along with King Arthur because he was like, oh, I hate that I can't announce myself honorably, you know. And also because he is one of the knight classes, right? So Archer was one, him, which is interesting because I didn't really think of Gilgamesh as being a knight. But okay, so it's Gilgamesh and then Arthur, who's the king of knights, and then now we have Lancer, Lancelot, which makes sense why he's standing under the tree calling out to a maiden. That's a very knight-like thing to do. Yeah, still Bluebeard, this guy. I don't know. I've got something ticking in my head, but I just can't place him. And that's Hassan, I guess. Yeah. I don't have a great sense of who he was, and I'll probably have to look Hassan up because... I don't have any background information on him. Oh, there you go. It's always red versus blue. Hey. All right. Okay, let's jump right to the fight because I don't think we should dilly-dally on that. All right, episode four, our first proper fight, obviously, because the one between Archer and Assassin was all staged. So let's go. And I'm sorry, it's around about that time of the day when everyone starts mowing their lawns. So hopefully it's not too loud because I can hear it. Okay, but anyway, let's do this. Episode four of Fate Zero in three, two, one, play. that mole on his eye. It's a nice detail. What? Was he trying to charm her with his eyes? <laughs> eh? <laughs> he was? Oh my gosh. <sighs> oh, also, her blade, you can't really see it. It's sort of wavering in the air. I guess that makes sense because if she took Excalibur out, oh, if she shows Excalibur, then it would just show her identity too. <gasps> that whore. These are two honourable spirits. <sighs> Aris, looks so worried. She's like, I just found my new husband. Don't want to lose her. <gasps> oh, those sound effects. They're there too. Just trying to like sniff out the other master. So he is supplying Saber with mana, right? Because he is there. Drum music. She's gonna die. She's not gonna make it out of this war. <laughs> Kawaii. Oh, he's so condescending. It's great. I feel uh, what I love most about the Kiritsugu and Arturia master servant relationship is that. They have such great difficulties seeing eye to eye on many things. And also, I think they look down on certain aspects of their character. But at the end of the day, if you're really all about, okay, it's all about what you ultimately want to get done uh, in this war, then they at least have a common goal on that. 
like using the grail for the good of other people and the world. Well, Atira is, is arguably even narrower than Kiritsugu's aim because she just wants to save Britain, which actually no longer exists in this world. So I don't know if it means like the Grail will give her an opportunity to travel back in time and somehow defeat the invading Saxons. But yeah, then I don't know how that would work in terms of timeline stuff, obviously, because it would mess a whole lot of things up. Like if actually Arturia had defeated the invading Saxons, I would probably be speaking Welsh, right? <laughs> because obviously English is from descended from the Anglo-Saxons not like the Welsh, which is, you know, what a lot of people in Romano Britain were speaking. Oh, that's, that's why it's amazing. And we haven't even started yet. So it's like a double lance wielder. Hmm. Those damn dual wielders. Oh, I, I love that we're hearing their battle strategy in their that's happening in their heads. Also, he can't see her blade, though. He is teasing her so bad. Ooh. It's footwork. Oh, servants can bleed. Okay. Of course they would. Yeah, so not knowing how long her blade is is a huge disadvantage. Kirei sh surely would not just blast Lancer, right? Like, that's against the rules, isn't it? Oh, look at those effects. Also, Arturi would be super pissed if he just... <gasps> and there's the other master. It's Archibald, yeah? Why doesn't he just kill him right now? Like, headshot. He is going to. <laughs> Oh, there are actual specified ranks. That's oh, pretty old school. <laughs> Speakerphone. It's innocent Arasville. And Kiritsuki is like, what rules? Hakujin. Huh? 
Well, yeah, I mean, whatever a puppet. Oh, a homunculus. Oh, so they they don't actually know like they knew Kiritsugu is a master, but not necessarily that his servant is Saber. So they're taking the bait that Kiritsugu set. Again, I feel like having multiple assassins is super cheating. <laughs> I think he's lost his chance to take the headshot. Yeah, I don't think it's a great idea to for a human to attack a servant. They still like sort of feeling each other out, <laughs> just wrecking the place while they're at it. <laughs> it's very polite. Also very condescending. <laughs> it's like, oh, you're pretty good for a girl. <laughs> They seem to really enjoy fighting each other, though. Unfortunately, their masters are not of the same. They don't subscribe to the same honor code. Just announce it. <laughs> yeah, doesn't that then narrow it down hugely because there's only so many famous swords in history? <laughs> Oh, those dodges. Oh, the hair. That was a great shot. Man, Saber's getting a free haircut. Oh, I loved how she like pushed his lance down with the blade. Oh, that's so awesome. Interesting. That was pretty cool. Like using his noble fantasm to like ascertain the length of her blade. Oh, shit. Oh, no. Oh. 
No. He got a... She got him though too, right? Right. Oh, so it only struck a flesh. Yeah. So it cuts through magical barriers. Yeah. But then she'll have to fall back on her actual skills as a swordsman. Mm. It's like a real fight now. Did she just like dissolve her magical armor? Ah, oh, okay, because she moved more freely without it. Hmm, all or nothing. I like that. <laughs> I like it. Epic choral music. Oh shit. No, she's gonna dodge and then thrust right. Wait, what? Oh, is he watching this from afar? <laughs> Just enjoying the show. I think he wants to fight Saber, right? Because Saber's the most powerful. Mm. It's like it's more of a party. <laughs> uh, he's so great. Enjoying even the fight to death. Yeah. <laughs> it's like not until we've had our fun. Oh gosh. Hmm. That is very impressive, very modern, actually. Wait, is he going to intervene so that Saber and Lancer don't kill each other? <laughs> uh. 
he Weaver has no control over Ryder at all. <laughs> he just throws that line there. That's my master. Just useless without her other arm. This is brutal. Oh, El Malloy. Archibald. He is a true asshole. Hmm. Oh, is that what's that there for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they know who each other is now. Okay, I don't think I've heard of his particular name. This is turning into such a compliments fest. So much confidence in her combat skills. Okay, here comes Ryder. <laughs> uh... <laughs> what an entrance. And Saber's like, what? He's king of conquerors. Gilgamesh is king of kings and Saber is king of knights. Okay. Oh, what? No way. That was it. I... <laughs> That literally felt like five minutes. Wait, was this a short episode? No? Oh, wow. <laughs> it's so crazy how drawn in you can get into these drawn out fights. I'm so... Oh, Alexander. It seems like everyone loved him. But yeah, it's so amazing the way that they would intersperse the fight scenes with uh, bits of story, or actually while they're fighting, you know, they're talking about who they are or who they think the other person is. And so you're actually, it's like while it's just this one big fight scene, you're actually learning so much about their backgrounds and their weapons and their abilities and I guess the advantages that they hold over, over other servants. Man, that was awesome. I do have to go back because there was quite like a bit of law, new law stuff as well. 
But yeah, I love all the details of Saber hiding, having to hide Excalibur, and then how Lancer chipped away at the magic that was protecting his identity around it so that he actually found out who she was. Okay. All right, let's talk about this. All right, just some really quick impressions from these two episodes. My favorite part, and there are a lot of excellent scenes in these episodes, but by far the relationship that's developed between Saber and Irisville, uh, I found the most enjoyable <laughs> because it's so gay and so wholesome. Uh, and there's so much trust between them already. It's actually quite fascinating. Interestingly, Arturia was not in on Kiritsugu's plan to blatantly show the two of them traveling together alone and hence making it seem like Irisville was Saber's master and not him. And even though the church and Tokiomi and Kirei already know that Kiritsugu is a master, it turns out that they have not yet discovered that his servant is Saber. So I think Kiritsugu knew that Arturia would not have been cool with that plan and probably would have fought him on it because it is such a low, <laughs> deceptive, dishonorable thing to do to use someone else as a meat shield even though it does have its strategic advantages uh it's very possible that irisville herself was in on that plan because she believes so much in kiritsugu and his ideals and his plans for the war but i am not sure to what extent she is aware of kiritsugu's character or you know, all the things that he gets up to. And it's not just being the, you know, done dirty part. Like he clearly has had a thing going on with his assistant killer, Maya, for quite some time. And I don't know if Arisil would even be upset at that or completely expect it, maybe even encourage it. Because as we found out, like these episodes, maybe as a homunculus, she feels like maybe she can't give him what he needs. I don't really know because uh, Arisville is so good. I love her to bits and clearly she loves being pampered based on how she took full advantage of having a legendary knight at her service. And that is something that Kiritsugu can't give her because she said that being happy causes pain for Kiritsugu. So he is clearly super messed up um, and maybe there's more of his backstory that we'll find to really understand why or how he came to be the way that he is. Um, the intriguing thing about Arisil also, well, as a homunculus, she also has healing powers, which was interesting. And she kept referring to herself as a puppet, which I'm assuming means that she was somehow artificially created for a specific purpose um, and that that purpose was likely... Um, critical to the outcome of the Grail War because Kiritsugu and the Ironsburn seem to be counting on Irisville's death somehow making a huge difference and I'm not looking forward to that because I really like her as a character but also I'm really curious to see um, with what purpose she was created for. The other curious thing is just before Saber and Lance's fight, Arisil hints that beyond healing, she can't do much for Saber. And she was referring to, I think, the fact that she's not her master and so she can't supply her with mana, like right there and then, which makes me wonder if this supply of mana works better if the master and servant are in close vicinity to each other. Because, well, both Kiritsugu and uh, what's his face, Kaneth, Archibald, were present at the fight. It's just that they weren't visible. So, yeah, that's an interesting limitation on the servants and their ability to fight. I guess they need their masters to keep going. The other dodge thing that we learnt the church and Kirei are up to is using Assassin's ability seemingly to split themselves into many, like their legion, Kirei is now ostensibly under the church's protection, which means that they can now just keep attacking from the shadows. So this splitting up ability seems to be a secret weapon of theirs. Not a secret for long though, because they're obviously you can only show up so many times before the other masters are like, wait, didn't I kill you like 10 times ago? Um, so I wonder if this ability to split up into different people is partly to do with uh, Hassan's legendary identity which 
I'm probably going to look up for next time because I don't think I'm going to get it just even if they gave us more clues. Uh, also, I'm loving how much strategy is involved in the battles that are going to be fought during this war. Uh, for example, I mean, secrecy is a huge advantage, not just the secrecy around the identities of the servants themselves, um, but also like their weapons, because in a sense, it's particularly for someone like Arturia, like showing your weapon uh, also reveals identity. And I guess if you know the identity of a servant, you could probably harness that as a weapon in the sense that you could potentially trigger, you know, their specific d desires and needs or get to know their weaknesses based on their stories. Um, we were also introduced to the concept of a noble phantasm, which is something that inherently gives away a servant's identity because it's a manifestation of that identity. So yeah, just a lot of a lot of things to sort of go over in the mind, but I love how it's all fitting together to really give a lot of depth to how this war can actually be fought and won. Okay, uh, Lancer, whose identity was not actually Lancelot, but a knight whom I've never heard of before, uh, Diomid of Dubny of the Knights of Fianna. Uh, I think I totally butchered that pronunciation. I'm so sorry. <laughs> But apparently a total player who has special charms due to the mole under his eye, which I found hilarious. Uh, I feel under different circumstances, he and Saber would be the best of mates and probably go to pubs and talk shit to each other <laughs> and just jokingly boast about who's the best. You know, it was a really uh, fascinating dynamic where they both wanted to have a fair fight, but their masters were just on a completely different page to them and really just wanted the deed to be done, like quick and dirty, you know? In fact, Kaneth seems to just treat Lancer like a lapdog, and I, I wonder if that's going to cause problems down the track for them, because it's not just about having weapons and that can slice through magic and all that, but also it's to what extent your master can back you up, I think. Uh, so yeah, at least with Kiritsugu, I know he also sometimes can be a bit condescending towards Arturia, but I feel he does have some sort of grudging respect for his servant and he would never like what Kana seems to do, just kind of order them <laughs> without any semblance of any respect at all. So yeah, I'll probably leave a blow by blow account of the fight between Saber and Lancer till next time, but the animation of the fight itself, all of the the swipes and the stabs and the sound effects of the clashing of the weapons was fantastic. That's all for today, guys. Make sure you leave any thoughts you might have down below, and I'm sure it's going to be a very, very interesting discussion for next time. So have a great weekend, and I'll see you all really soon.